Those are moody pictures you take. Oh, yeah, oh, it's war. American Matt Schreier is, or was, a photographer, freelancing in Syria a few years ago. This is the wall, you stick your head out there, you're dead. He never romanticized his role, he just happened to have a good eye and guts. For 18 days in 2012, he was heart-stoppingly close to battle. Then he began to wrap up, he was going home. All was fine, until it wasn't. December 31st, 2012, minutes from the Turkish border, on his way out, Schreier's cab gets cut off. At first I was like, whoa, you know, I smiled because I thought we averted an accident, and that's when they jumped out, you know, with the AKs, the guy was all in black. I looked at him, he looked at me, and then he pulled the hat over my eyes, and he pushed my head down, put the gun to my head. And in your head, what's happening in that moment? I was, all right, you know, I was like, all right, my life's changed, I've just been kidnapped. He'd been snatched by men from the feared Jabhat al-Nusra, an al-Qaeda affiliate in Syria. It's just the way he is that Matt doesn't get emotional about all that was about to happen, but it was awful. Taken for interrogation to, of all places, the Aleppo Pediatric Hospital. You know, I got out and just kids everywhere. You know, my hat was pulled down so I could just see the feet. They brought an interrogator to, uh, who spoke perfect English. Started asking me questions about my background, what I was doing there, if I speak Arabic, you know, the whole nine yards. And, you know, I lied, I said it was German. Why? Because I'm Jewish. It gets ugly. After a few weeks, he hears people being tortured down the hall. Terrified, he starts to wonder if his mom has started looking for him. Measuring time becomes important. I knew what date it was that I got kidnapped, and you know, every day I would say the dates like 10 times. Yeah, I'd say in this, you know, like February 25th, 2013. Yeah. I would just say it every day. Doesn't matter how dark the room is, if you can see the light under the door and you can hear the Adan, you know what time it is and you can ballpark it. So he knows that it was nearly a month after being grabbed when he's shoved into another room comes face to face with another stricken looking hostage. Another American. And then I looked at him and I was like, Jesus Christ. And that's when it rang and it was like the worst moment of my life because I was like, this guy is an American. He's been here for a long time. And the fact that they just let me see him means that I am not going anywhere. Matt Schreier was now sharing a filthy cell with Theo Padnos, an American journalist who'd been held for months. Maybe it was panic or trauma, but these two didn't get along. They fought a lot over scraps of food, tiny blankets, and big, dangerous plans, like their first escape attempt. Matt says Theo wanted to make a hole in the door. They tried, and then they got caught. The door opened, and they came, and there were about, I don't know, eight of them dressed all in black, like the guy on in the videos that you're used to seeing. And they came in, they took Theo, they turned him around, they cuffed him, and they took him out of the room, and within a couple of minutes, I heard him screaming. Matt's turn was coming. Soon enough, he'd be dragged into a boiler room, ordered to sit down with knees up high. And they force a tire around your knees, and then they put a bar over it, and you can't move your, your feet. And they flip you over with your feet in the air. And, uh, and then they, they take a cable, it's about this thick, and they, they go to work on you, and they bang your feet with them, and they take turns doing it like sets of 15. They'll stop, pour water on your feet to make it hurt more. And like a half hour later, they came and they took us, and they put us in the trunk of an SUV, and they drove us to the Electrical Institute in Hedatan. The Electrical Institute, northeast of Aleppo, here, Matt and Theo are practically starved, given contaminated water, beaten, tasered. And here, they have disturbing encounters with three masked strangers. It starts January 31st, 2013, the date imprinted on Matt's mind. He's taken alone to a small room. As soon as I sat down, somebody in very good English said, uh, how are you? And I was just like, you know, I miss my family. 
They gave me a piece of paper and they were like, we want all your passwords, all your codes, we want your social security number, we want, you know, I filled up the piece of paper with, you know, all the people you know in the country, you know, blah, 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 everything so they can rob me. You know, they were very, 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 very polite. The one that was doing the computers was pudgy, we called them chubs. Uh, there was another one with uh, droopy eyes and some red in his beard. And the leader, who seemed to be the leader, was very easy to find because he had these big, thick rimmed glasses. And he spoke Arabic. The men have guns, sometimes two each, grenades, and a laptop. They make Matt log into his accounts. Theo, too. Only after his session, he said he recognized something in their voices. Theo knew where they were from. Theo grew up in Vermont, right on the border. And he knew, as soon as he came back, he's like, they're Canadians. So I was just like, yeah, right, you don't know what you're talking about. He's like, no, they're Canadians. He's like, I know they're Canadians. And uh, he was right. It would be nearly a year before Matt says he got confirmation they were Canadians, and before he learned what they were after. They were kids, these Canadians. They were not like the ones the British guys who were cutting everybody's heads off. They weren't like those guys. These guys were idealists. You know what I mean? They, they didn't lay a finger on me. They could have. They could have done whatever they want. They gave me Kit Kat. They gave you Kit Kat? They gave me a Kit Kat and a cookie when I was being starved. But hardly benign, gentle souls. March 2013, three months into his captivity, he saw one of the Canadians again, Chubbs. Matt, forced to wear an orange jumpsuit and record a video under threat of being electrocuted, it was Chubbs pushing him to confess to being a CIA agent. I was like, no, 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 no. I don't want my mother to see me like this. Curiously, that video never aired anywhere, and Matt was determined to save himself. Months later, in the summer, he and Theo made a new plan to get out. He noticed some wires in the cell window were weak. Then I started shaking each wire. And I noticed that the vertical wires, none of them are welded. They all move. And the horizontal wires, three of them are welded on one side, so you can't pull it off. But the other side, you can move them. And the verticals were very thin wires, like paper clips. So if I unweave them, all of them, I can bend them back and get out. And that was the plan. Bend them and then squeeze out. They'd have to pick their moment. For days, Matt saves drips of oil from the few olives they were fed, anything to help them slide through the tiny opening. It was summer, Ramadan. July 29th, they wait until dawn when the captors were praying or sleeping. Matt would get out the window first. Once that thing snapped, you know, we get out or we get tortured or killed. So it snapped and uh, I was like, all right, you ready? So he boosted me up. I went Superman style, both arms got right out, sucked in my stomach, and then I got stuck around the waist because I had my pants on. So I reached in and I unbuttoned my pants. As soon as I unbuttoned my pants, I just slid out. Then Theo's turn. Matt tries to pull him out, but he gets stuck. I got my foot against the wall and pulling it. The window is above me, it's open, the lights are on. They're in there. So if they come over, you know, I'm dead. They're not, it's not America. They're not gonna tell me to freeze, I'm dead. And I was just like, you're not kidding. And I, by then it felt like, you know, Three, three minutes, four minutes. And uh, he said, come back. And I was like, I can't come back. And I just sat there waiting for him to say, and he was just finally, he said, all right, go. And as soon as he said that, I was out. Theo Padnos is left behind. He stays a hostage for another year. Matt reasoned if he got to safety, maybe he could help authorities get Theo out. People seem to ignore this panicking figure running through Aleppo. Then I was on a main road, and I saw an old man, so I run up to him. Sayyad Niyajuk, Sayyad Niyajuk. Which goes, means what? Help me. Help me, please. And he goes, no, in English. 
More darting down side streets. Finally, a young man hears him out. I'm like, all right, this is it. You know, either you're going to get rescued or they're going to turn you back over. So this is it. And that was it. Seven months after being captured, Matt Schreier had finally found the person who would help him get home. So he could start to figure out a way to get Theo out and start to process everything that had happened to him. But it's not always easy coming home and life got a lot harder when Matt started to piece together exactly what it is those apparent Canadians he'd encountered had been up to all this time. Remember the men who took his banking details and his passwords? Well, they'd been busy. After escaping from the grip of Al-Qaeda, back at home in New York, Matt Schreier has a lot to wrestle with. So you sort of think your nightmare is over, but it's not, right? Right. Right. Oh, see, there you go, more. He spends months sifting through emails he'd missed as a hostage. In hundreds of messages, there are dozens of invoices. Purchases made online with his money from his accounts during the early months of 2013, exactly the time he was being held. I think they took 16,000 plus a grand from my business account. They would have gotten 25 altogether. He found records of nearly 100 purchases all told. Gradually, Matt traces where all that stuff was going, mostly to addresses in Turkey, places close to the border with Syria. One receipt showed money moving through Indonesia. Then came a few that puzzled him. Shipping orders for Canada, one for an address in Laval, although in the end, nothing was sent there. Then another order for February 13, 2013, the same week Matt was being interrogated by those supposed Canadians. Hundreds of dollars worth of camera equipment ordered, addressed to a Montreal apartment, but it was canceled. Yet another receipt days later for two tablets that were delivered to that same apartment in privileged Westmount. There is a name on the receipt, but we're not showing it or revealing his identity because it really isn't clear what this man's connection is to the kidnapping or the Canadian captors. Matt Schreier gave all this information to the FBI and the RCMP, but senses they didn't do much about it. Neither agency would talk with us. So we went looking for the man from Westmount and found him, a young French-Canadian convert with no criminal record. Off camera, we asked repeatedly if he'd do an interview and explain. Was this shipment to him a mistake, or is he in any way connected with those who held Matt Schreier? He refused to be interviewed or even look at the receipts. So, one last chance to try to get answers. I'm Adrian from the CBC. You, you know I have to ask you about this. If this is a mistake, let us know, because on the face of it, it just looks like Al-Qaeda guy sent you tablets. I'm really sorry. Sorry for what? I don't have to can you explain this though? Because it just doesn't look good. Look, these, this is two tablets sent to you on Matt Schreier's account. No, please, I'm, I'm really sorry. Do you know Matt? I'm sorry? Do you know Matt Schreier? I don't want to answer your question. I'm, I'm really I know sorry. you don't want to interview, but these are questions that kind of have to get answered. I'm sorry. You know he was held for months and tortured. I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. Do you have any thoughts for him? I don't want to come out. I know you don't. But he wants answers, and lots of people do. So that's it? Nothing? No explanation, but we've learned he's been questioned by the RCMP, has had his passport and some electronics seized. Why? Police won't say. And the supposed Canadians who held Matt, who and where are they? Again, police won't talk. This all swirls in Matt Schreier's head. How do you think you're doing? I'm doing great, you know, except for this. You know, this is what bothers me the most. Like, you know, when I'm talking to my girlfriend and I'm complaining about things, I never, ever talk about what happened in Syria. It's behind me. This stuff is not. He needs answers. Who held him? Who defrauded him? What is happening with the investigation? What are his thoughts for Canada now? I would like the uh, Canadian authorities to prove that they are not on the leash of the FBI. Go do something. Do something. 
This is a man who says he saved his own life, feels like he's conducting his own investigation, and he wants to know, when it comes to those Canadians, who will hold them accountable? Adrian Arsenault, CBC News, New York.